So hello and welcome to the folks that are joining us for uh, one of the final Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness presentations of the month. Aloha and welcome. I'm Elizabeth with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council and I'm going to be starting a poll for the folks that are joining us on the Zoom live webinar. It is um, just gathering a little bit of demographic information. We really appreciate you letting us know where you're coming from in your background. And I'm going to hand it off to Serena Fukushima with the Maui Invasive Species Committee. All right. Aloha, my kako. Aloha, everybody. Mahalo for joining us. Like Beth said, this is one of our final presentations of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. I um, hope you all had a chance to join us and to listen to all of um, the great presentations throughout the month with the statewide initiative. I'm really excited for our group here today, but before we get going, um, I wanted to just do some housekeeping. Um, we have a webinar format, so we won't be able to see you or necessarily hear you. Um, so the chat is a great function to use to communicate with our speakers and to ask questions. Um, you can go in the chat or the Q&A on the Zoom platform. If you're joining us on Facebook, we are streaming live on the Maui Invasive Species Committee Facebook. So feel free to ask any questions, drop any comments in the comment section there as well, and we'll be checking that. Um, we have a really exciting pre-recorded session today. Um, our Molokai guys are super akamai and didn't want any interruptions with their internet. So uh, we have a pre-recorded session, but we also have the whole gang here with us as well. And so we'll be launching that recording shortly. Um, and then um, they'll be available for questions after. Uh, but just want to give you guys a couple more seconds to fill out your poll and then we the will poll the poll is done and it looks like we have folks from throughout the states and with from a bunch of different backgrounds so thank you very much for sharing that information awesome mahalo all right well i'm so excited to introduce our group today uh, we have all of the molokai maui invasive species committee which is a subcommittee of misc um, with us right now is Lori Buchanan, who is the project coordinator, Kamalani Pali, uh, Kamalani Pali, who's our field crew leader, Tyson Pacto is a field associate too, Kavehi Soares is a field associate too, and Mahina Poipoi, who is their education and outreach assistant. So they are the ones that will be presenting um, today about upside down jellyfish and answering your questions after. And so I will hand it off to Beth to share the recording. Mahalo everyone. Aloha everyone. Mahalo for attending our presentation today about upside down mangrove jellyfish control at Kanakakai Wharf Island of Molokai. We are the Molokai Maui Invasive Species Committee, also known as MOMISC. Next slide. MOMISC is a subcommittee of the Maui Invasive Species Committee. We are a team of five made up of Lori Buchanan, our project coordinator, and our field crew, Kamalani Pali, who is our field crew leader, Tyson Pactal, and Kavehi Soares, who are both field associates too. They are our boots on the ground, and in this case, our tabbies in the water. They traverse thousands of acres every year, serving and controlling invasive species on Molokai. And myself, Mahina Poipoi, I am an education and outreach assistant. MOMISC's mission is to prevent and control new invasive species from becoming established and widespread on Molokai. Next slide. So why is MOMISC controlling jellyfish? In 2009, a young father and his children came into our office carrying a bucket filled with a strange glistening something. Red welts were evident all over their bodies and the dad suspected that they were being stung by this alien in their bucket. The family was swimming in a designated area at the Kanakakai Wharf. We didn't know what it was and after some research and reaching out to colleagues, it was determined that the alien in the bucket was in fact a jellyfish. Everyone was concerned about the stinging risk to our community, 
mailing our children that swim in the harbor regularly. Momisk agreed that the infestation of the species at the Kanakakai Wharf was a threat to health and safety of our community, and we have been controlling upside down jellyfish there since. Next slide. Uh, species highlight, Cassiopeia andromeda, first introduced to Hawaii in the 1940s by, by way of hull fouling at Pearl Harbor. Um, we are not the scientific experts on this particular species, but perhaps the most notable characteristic of the jellyfish species is that it, the way it orients itself upside down on the ocean floor. This species will spend much of its life in this upside down position, and unlike free floating jellyfish or Portuguese man o' war, will remain fairly stationary. The reason for this has largely to do with the habitat and feeding, which will be covered in the following slide. The exact color of the jellyfish will vary depending on the algae living within its tissues. The orientation and coloration help to create a camouflage and unsuspecting effect. Often said, is that they look like a flower blooming or are mistaken as being sea vegetation. To me, they look like giant white brown pancakes. This docile appearance is not by accident, but to attract prey and support the forming of symbiotic relationships. A few other interesting facts is that they reproduce both sexually and asexually. A single polyp can produce multiple adults called medusas, not only can Cassiopeia produce their own food through a symbiotic algae called Zunzantelis, but they also can use their surface stingers, also known as nematocysts, which can be used to get other sources of food, including zooplankton, fish eggs, and larvae. These jellyfishes have a third way of getting their food and that it can shoot a mucus about 20 centimeters high that contains small stinging cells called cassiosomes. These cassiosomes also contain Zunzantelis, which act like a mini battery pack that helps it to survive up to 10 days in the ocean. Cassiopeia has a primary mouth located in the center with up to 40 smaller mouths found throughout the surface of its arms. Unlike upside down jellyfish have no brain, no eyes or heart and are an important food source for animals like the ocean sunfish and leather sea, sea back turtle. Next slide. So habitat, this is um, the top center picture is where we control the jellyfish at the Kanakakai Wharf in downtown. Um, they prefer warm, shallow, calm waters. Examples, mud flats, mangrove swamps, wetlands, fish ponds. Um, this species is very particular about its habitat. They, they, they like mangrove areas because it's ideal for reproduction. That's where the polyps can attach itself. They tend to exist in large swarms and they, they're known to be on the islands of Oahu, Molokai and Hawaii Island. Next slide. Surveys for upside down jellyfish are usually conducted prior to anticipated increase in recreational recreational use of the wharf area, such as school breaks, canoe races, and fishing tournaments. We also have to be mindful of vehicular and vessel traffic in the area for safety reasons. So avoiding high traffic days like barge days and informing the harbor master before conducting our survey helps to increase our safety in and out of the water. With general weather conditions, the wind, rain, and clouds can make it hard to see the jellyfish but the time of day is also critical because of the position of the sun can cre create a glare off of the ocean surface, also making it hard to see. And the tide can affect water clarity and increase safety risk, which can limit our time in the water. Marine life such as eels, sharks, unstable coral structures, and other types of jellyfish can also make surveying difficult. Next slide. By using the proper PPE, we can help mitigate those risks. For our, our surveys, each member is equipped with tubbies, gloves, GPS, scoop net, a spear to help with balance as well as protection, and a bikini or a bin on a flotation device to uh, help hold the jellyfish once it's captured. 
Additional dive gear like wetsuits, goggles, snorkel, and fins are used if necessary. Since we mostly go during the spring and summer months, we also make sure to wear long sleeve shirts, rash guards, hats, sunglasses, face wraps, sunscreen to help prevent sunburn. And we also ensure that everyone stays hydrated at all times. Next slide. Here is our map of the surveys and control work we did of upside down jellyfish at Konokakai Wharf from June 3rd, 2009 to June 9th, 2021. Our main focus are the recreational swimming raft, boat ramp, and canoe club areas. It was mentioned by dive workers who dove in and around the channels that the upside down jellyfish were also present there. Next slide. Here is our data we collected from over the years. We partnered with different agencies such as DAR, Division of Aquatic Resources, AmeriCorps, HYCC, and KUPU. The bulk of our total hours in jellyfish control can be allocated to initial suppression on August 24, 2009, with DAR leader Cecil Walsh and her team, in which we controlled 434 jellyfish. We usually conduct surveys once or twice a year, but when there is an increase in jellyfish population, we increase our surveys monthly until the current population decreases and or is eliminated. Next slide. So we know we can measure our success by the overall downward trend in detections over time as depicted in the prior graph. Also by our ability to conduct a full sweep of the infest site in less time. Our work is highly visible and it naturally affects a chat Curious residents, as you can see here, through these interactions with our community, we are able to provide species education and teach area users how to identify, avoid, and report these species. It also gives us the opportunity to share about invasive species issues as a whole. Next slide. And with that, mahalo everyone for attending our presentation today. A big, big mahalo to all of our partners pictured here. And thank you to the Hawaii Invasive Species Council for the opportunity to share our work today. Aloha. All right, mahalo again for that great presentation. I learned a lot. I didn't know um really anything about this test until um, talking with you folks about it so thank you for sharing that for that great presentation we don't really always get to hear all the voices of everybody um that are working in these efforts so that was really really awesome thank you um do we have any questions in the chat in the q a um this is the time folks if you have any questions for these guys um, about upside down jellyfish or any other work that MOMIS does. Um, Adam Radford says, great job. The only invasive species committee working on aquatic species. You guys rock. Agreed. <laughs> All right, any questions? Or maybe it was just so thorough that no one has questions. Oh, see one. So Monty, um, who's on our LFA crew at MISC, he's saying, great presentation. Question, are these jellyfish being controlled anywhere else in Hawaii? Um, hi, Serena. Thank you for the question, Monty. I have been told by um, local EA, uh, fish pond um, persons doing restoration, that they uh, are definitely working to try and control um, the mangrove jellyfish in their fish ponds. Uh, on the island of Molokai, um, they're very prevalent in one of the active fish ponds on the east side of Molokai. And they have been doing a lot of research on how to remove them because the numbers there are quite high um, and their, their circumstances are different. Um, the, the adjacent parcels have different types of use which may or may not be contributing to the high numbers of jellyfish in their specific areas. But they definitely, it does um, affect their ability to do fish pond restoration. So yes, they are managing it as best they can. Thank you for the question. Sure. 
Yeah, I can see how that can get in the way when you're working in the water and um, trying to do fish pond restoration, how that is very difficult if you're getting stung all day. Um, all right, so we have a question from um, Adam's wife, Betsy. She wants to know how big they get and that she'd love to join for a survey and removal operation. So I guess the first question is how big they get and then are there opportunities um, if we are on Molokai to come and help with these efforts? Or for people who are on Molokai in the presentation right now. It can get up to 12 inches wide and two inches high. Yeah, I think my personal best was the guy 15, 15 inches in diameter. That was the biggest one I ever caught. Wow. <laughs> and bring your tubbies, Betsy. <laughs> bigger than a dinner plate. Yeah, so do you folks offer any opportunities? I know right now with COVID volunteering, it's definitely different from how it used to be. Um, but do you folks have any opportunities for volunteers that are on island or um, that might be coming eventually um, to come and do work days to help with that? Or is it more so just if you get a bunch of people that are really excited and want to do it, you just take them out? <laughs> well, well, right now during COVID, no, we did um, suspend our volunteer, um, you know, program or just taking volunteers because of COVID. We've not lifted that um, restriction as of yet, but staff is different, Maui, um, and they're more than welcome to come. I think in the same area, um, the same people that are doing um, the fish pond restoration is also gathering a gorilla ogo in the same area. And so there is other people that um, have noticed that there is um, mangrove jellyfish, but at least they know now um, what to do and how to control it. And if they see it while they're doing their gorilla ogo removal, they are trying to assist that way, but not as a direct volunteer of um, Momis. But we appreciate the community's help. Thank you. Awesome. Got another question. Are they taken out of the water as a means of control? Yep. And I know with the Gorilla Ogo, sometimes they use that as fertilizer. Um, is the jellyfish kind of used in the same way or is it just sort of just take them out and get rid of them? Um, yeah, we usually take them back to our base yard, um, lay them out in a field and um, just let them kind of dry up. Nice. But uh, the holly coal and um, the the kind the grasses love it. Yeah, they get mm -hmm. fertilized. Could be an yeah, we usually thing. try and remove it um in the water with the scoop net. Then that's why we have the bikinis in on like floaters. So we just we scoop it up and we put it in the in the bikini. Then we can just continue our survey and move on. But it is also a little bit of a risk because they as soon as we we scoop them up to start to release their spores. So it does get kind of itchy or scratchy or irritating too. So you gotta really, as soon as you hit, you scoop it up, put them in the bin and you keep moving forward. And at the same time, just kind of like navigate your way across looking because as soon as you scoop too, you kind of mud out the area. So it kind of gets murky. So you gotta know where to go after. And in case there's another one in the general vicinity, we gotta know exactly where the next one is. If not, down is just gonna get triggered and down is gonna release and, and it just turns into a bigger mess. <laughs> yeah, it's just like how you go crabbing, you just gotta like, you know, like dance out the whole area and just gotta walk them, kind of methodical. Wow, that makes sense. And that sounds really, um, you gotta really be on it and kind of moving quickly so they're not spreading further, right? So, ooh. yeah. Um, Monty has a question. Um, it was mentioned that these jellyfish haven't spread to Maui or Lanai. Are they not very good at long distance dispersal? So maybe not getting pushed around in the currents or they're not really good. Well, they can they swim. Okay. Yeah, they can swim. So I, I wouldn't doubt it, but the current goes from Maui to, to Molokai. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure. If they can go up current. Molokai is a friendly aisle, right? Maybe they just don't want to leave. No, <laughs> kick them out. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Yeah, I wonder if, you know, especially in like 
big um, swells or things like that, or if they're able to get pushed around on other islands. We just had a speaker from Koho Olave, so that would be interesting to know if it ever maybe gets that way or. Maybe Kona storms can push them. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a great presentation for people to keep their eyes and ears out. Well, eyes out and and feet out, I guess, <laughs> for looking for these on other islands and places. Um, Jamie is asking from OISC, are they stuck to the ocean floor well, or is it easy to scoop them up? Um, easy for scoop them up. Yeah, they're kind of just laying there, just kind of easy for slide the net rather than eat. Yeah, they're kind of heavy though. So those red nets, I will use the uh, aluminum black nets, maybe. Yeah, easier for scoop them than on some more in crab, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking if they can get up to 15 inches round and two inches thick, they're probably pretty heavy and full of water. And so you definitely want to get a good, a good net. Uh, Beth has a question. How are they being transported around? Could boats and barges potentially move them? You know, I wanted to jump on that because um, it's the same vectoring that um, we see, you know, with all invasive species because there's a lot of recreational use um, in the area as well as in the fish ponds. And so they may be transported um, via equipment and boats and, and humans, um, you know, like everything else is spread. Um, and then also the spores and the eggs are affixed also to the underside of leaves um, that also can be floated away just like the mangrove seeds and become established elsewhere. So I'm assuming that the potential vector for that is, is the floating of the seeds and establishing itself um, all around, but also by humans and equipment and other stuff, the normal stuff that spreads stuff around. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, and I think it's a testament to the work you folks are doing because when you think about a marine species like this and the potential for it to spread and the currents and, you know, I'm frankly surprised that we don't see it in more places. So I think that's a testament to the work that you folks are doing in controlling it and making sure it doesn't get, you know, I know why. So um, yeah, mahalo for that. Any other questions in the chat, in the Q&A? We had a few people on Facebook as well. Now's your chance. Um, I think I have a question. If any of you folks have ever gotten stung and how would you rate the pain scale and what do you do to treat this thing? And sorry if you said this in the presentation already, but um, yeah, what are those methods to help treat with this thing? Because I'm thinking this is way worse than amount of war, right? So um, how have you guys handled that? Um, just try not to get stung. <laughs> is the main goal. Is, yeah, you know, really like the kind get stung. Just it's not as bad as the man of war because it's more yeah. spread out. Like the man of war is more like concentrated, the sting and and so once you feel it, it's like a little itch at first and then it starts stinging. But um once you get stung, then I would just walk away, like get away from that area because Yeah, the thing will be all over on water, you know water. Yeah. But usually if you go low tide, not too bad, you can minimize your races. Shucks on your legs and stuff gonna get stung there. Yeah. At least not all the way up high. All right, good to know. And I didn't realize it was less painful than a matter where, so it's good to know too. But number one, prevention, don't get stung. <laughs> yeah, get stung. <laughs> All right. Well, mahalo, everybody. It looks like um, there aren't any more questions in the chat, but feel free to um, reach out to these folks um, with the info that they provided or on our Maui Invasive Species Facebook page, and we can pass it on to them. Um, just wanted to note we are reaching the end of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Um, we're in our last week until the end of February. Uh, we do have some Presentations coming up though, um, we have tomorrow, or I think Saturday, we have Huyo Ko'olau Poko um, doing a workday actually. So we have workdays happening, ongoing. 
Um, but speaker wise, tomorrow we have the Kauai Invasive Species Committee um, Forest Friday talk story on, and the title of that is Ohia Word Staking. So mm -hmm. it'll be a really interesting um, conversation. They're also doing a virtual huakai, um, kahakai down in Hawaii land trust area um, out over on Kauai. And then on Monday, we have our Haisam closing ceremony with Hello Ohia, and that'll be live streamed and you can join on their Facebook. But after, other than that, this is the end. So mahalo nui, you guys, for a great presentation and really um, ending this month with a bang. So mahalo again for joining, and we'll see you all soon. Mahalo. Thank you, Hiss. <laughs> mahalo. Thank you.